Bible with you, I will turn to chapter one of John's Gospel because I'm actually going to go through the whole of the 14 verses. Uh, you will know this in various forms from Christmas. Okay, this is the absolute climax of the nine lessons of carols you might see or hear from King's College and many carol services save this particular reading to the end really to give an understanding of what's going on and so we look at this particular reading as core to our understanding of what the bible is telling us who the person of jesus is we've been going through this series for the past term which was devised by the theologian uh, tom wright uh, uh, the foremost theologian of our time and he's taken us into some very strange places to try and understand throughout the Bible key passages that give us an understanding of our relationship with God. And apologies to Shola for last week, we had Daniel. And those wonderful, wonderful visions, which were scary and confusing. And yet when we come to this part of the scripture, this prologue to John's gospel might help us to understand that what we may have seen last week as scary and confusing is actually part of the purposes of God. That what we're looking at is a God of love and a God of power. So we have the prologue to John's Gospel and, and you will now already, I've only been here six months, you're already we bored. And you're still gonna get even more bored with me every time we go into John's Gospel saying, every time you go to John's Gospel, read the prologue. Because otherwise you don't have the key to what's going on. Jesus in John's gospel can look remote, can look confusing, can look just weird, and maybe a little off-putting, unless you look through the purposes of what he's doing through the lens of what you see here. This is the Morse code key for what John then writes. And as it so happens, John brings us at this point something very special, an understanding of the purposes of God up to this point and the eternal purposes of God beyond the life of Jesus on earth. So let's have a look, if you have uh, Bibles with you, let's have a quick look through the 14 verses. Don't worry, it won't take very, very long. And John, we don't know his name, don't know that the writer of John's Gospel is anyone called John, by the way, but I'll use that as a shorthand. John starts really to get everyone's attention. He's writing to a community who were Jewish originally. So you start by writing in the beginning, it's going to get someone's attention, isn't it? Because, hey, presto, isn't that something to do with the beginning of, of the Bible? The opening words of the Bible, the opening words of the scripture in the beginning clearly gets the attention. And then he doesn't change what Genesis says. He elaborates on it. He doesn't change it. He's not saying Genesis was wrong. He says, actually, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He's explaining a bit more about the nature of God at that point. Now, the Word seems a bit strange to us to talk about what's going on. The word, what's that about? Those of you who know me know that I avoid word, I use something else instead. But actually the word, a person's word, in many places around the world mean different things from as you are here. I remember when I went to theological college, went five years ago, okay, and meeting a, a student there who'd come from South Africa. He was talking about the death of his father and how, as his father had died, everyone was asking, what did he say? And his last words were to reveal what was in his soul. The most important part of his identity were going to be his last words. So whereas I then said, oh, I'm going to use the word processor, because they were new and newfangled in those days, okay? You can't process someone's word. It is their soul, it is their being. And this is much more what we have here. The being of God, the word of God, 
was with God and was God, was with God in the beginning, and through him all things were made that have been made. Whatever this word is, this part of God, is integral to creation, integral to the person of God, is the person of God. And that's what those first two verses are. When we're looking at the word, we're looking at God. We're looking at God in total. Not a bit of God. God in total. And that's the key to what happens next. And then we get to verse 5. I'll read it to you. If you haven't got the scripture in front of you. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Previous verse, John has said, the word is the light. And that is so easy to skip past as jolly nice, especially when you read this at Christmas time, and there may be a Christmas tree up in church, and the lights are twinkling away. The light shines in the darkness. Yes, they have a fuse this year. Yet. But actually, this is so profound. This reaches into us. It's very easy to have scripture the way we do things here and be completely disconnected in what's going on in the world. And yet these words here should reach into our hearts, but often we skip past them. Yes, I try and avoid watching the news at the moment. It just depresses me. And yes, if we were to, anyone were to say, is there darkness in the world? Who's going to say no? We live in difficult, violent times. And maybe here, bizarrely of all places, we avoid a lot of that. But there's a war on. People's rights are being taken away. We're struggling with the health service in this country. People are fleeing war, fleeing persecution. There's darkness. Does not the world need light? Does, does not the world need light? Uh, uh, jolly good, jolly good. Just wondering if, if, if I was on the right track there. Jolly good. Yes, the world needs light. Of course it does. And what it says here is when you get depressed at the news, is the wonderful thing that shines onto it. It's the darkness that win. Political oppression that win. War doesn't win. Famine doesn't win. Hunger doesn't win. The light wins. Jolly good. Let's go. But ah, it's not all that. What happens if the darkness isn't sunny out there? What if we read this for ourselves? What if we read this in a manner in which we are approaching God to understand ourselves a bit more? Because kind of that's what scripture's for. And we recognize the darkness in here. Scary, isn't it? Looking inside and finding things you don't like. Looking inside, finding things you don't like. The darkness does exist in here. It must exist in here. It must exist in each one of us, otherwise the darkness that we see out there couldn't happen. Those of you involved with the survivors group will know about how much sexual violence takes place. That couldn't happen unless there's a darkness in here. Many people have suffered from some form of prejudice, violence, to do with sex, to do with race, to do with sexuality. That doesn't happen unless we carry a darkness in here. Confession time. I have to daily confront the darkness in here, knowing that it, I carry it. As a white man, I carry a darkness which I want to get rid of. As a white man, I carry vestiges of racism. And without me confronting that within myself, what happened to George Floyd is going to continue to happen.
I carry within me vestiges of sexual expectation. And without me confronting that within myself, what happened to Sarah Everard is going to continue to happen. We can skip past this verse and say that's something to do with the news. But actually, unless we confront the darkness in ourselves, then there's no point going out into the world. The, evangel the evangelization of the world starts with our own repentance, confronting the darkness that we carry. Whatever it is, And the good news isn't just for what happens on the news. The good news is what happens in here. The darkness doesn't win. The darkness doesn't win. But in order for us to confront it, we have to admit it first. In churchy terms, we call that repentance, don't we? In churchy terms, we call that repentance. And it is painful. We can have nothing to say to the people walking past. We can have nothing to say on a Facebook page. We can have nothing to say when we get the web page redesigned, which is happening at the moment. We have nothing to say to hurting people out there in their darkness unless we're confronted with the darkness in here. And being in a church doesn't make us immune from it. The statistics for things like sexual violence don't change in churches from any other organization. If we are to evangelize the world, if we are to evangelize one person walking out past the front door of the church, every single one of us must confront whatever the darkness is in our hearts. Whatever it is, however we contribute to the violence that we see outside. Because we do, and if we don't admit it, we're colluding. It would seem a heavy way to go, wouldn't it? And yet, with that challenge in mind, John goes on and says, but the darkness doesn't win. The light comes into the world. That is a celebration of the life of Christ. Not that we wallow in anger and pity at ourselves and our own shortcomings, but that actually the person of Christ, the person of the word, comes to confront the darkness, and the darkness does not win, not out there, not in here. The true light, verse 9, that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. And then we get to the, the verse 14. The verse Keith read to us, which kind of fits in with everything we've been doing up to now and gives an understanding not of just of John's gospel, but the person of Jesus. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. After what I've just said, what? The word, the essence of God, God's soul, if you would. What? How, how, what? After I have just taken us into the slough just bond, looking into our own hearts and the evil and violence that we each carry and saying we have to do something about it, the next thing that John comes up with is, hey, look who's there as well. The word of God, God incarnate, God who becomes human, comes to be the light that dwells with us in spite of, in spite of who we are. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Ah, oh, yes, now let light, lights on the Christmas tree. No, no. The word became flesh and dwelt among us in spite 
of what we carry in us. This isn't lights on the Christmas tree. This is transforming us so that we can transform the world. If we're looking through this particular series of readings that we've been given by Tom Wright, it starts off in the Garden of Eden. God has always wanted to be with his people. We've been through the, the wanderings in the desert with the Hebrew people being given the law. God has said, this is the party we're having together. And the meeting then builds a tabernacle, a tent to travel with his people. And literally this particular verse, verse 14, word became fresh and made his dwelling among us. What it actually says in, in, in the Greek is pitched his tent with us. So when we move, he moves too. Is with us in our joy, our sorrow, in our repentance and with our praise. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have to understand, otherwise it doesn't make sense. First of all, that the person of Jesus is God. Otherwise, the cross makes no sense. It's just sad. But once we change the label and say that Jesus is God, the label on the cross stops being failure and starts being victory and love. Once we understand that Christ came, Jesus, the person of God, came to be with us, and, the, and he was the light, and the light didn't overcome the word of God, the light of God, the person of God, then we are equipped to go into the darkness in ourselves and confront it in order that we can then confront the darkness in the world and truly evangelize around us. I don't know who is leading our prayers. Hillary is leading the prayers. Shola is leading the prayers. 